Donaldson got caught. McDavid shot, save, rebound, score! Up to McLeod, to the net, deflected home! Draw, Bouchard in for Johnson, tipped home! Picker, wrist shot, missed! Down low, McLeod waits, scores! Dealing, wrist shot, score! Press up, beautiful move, wrist shot, save, rebound, score! Against Pittsburgh head to head by a combined 29 to 9. Tonight, no contest. 6 1 your final. It's really going to happen, isn't it? For the first time in Sidney Crosby's career, he's going to miss the playoffs in back to back seasons. There's still 22 games left in the Penguin season, but with them sitting 10 points out of the last playoff spot and watching them get dismantled night after night, playoffs are highly unlikely. Pittsburgh Penguins are broken, and it's tough to watch the greatest player of this generation go down with the ship. After yet another demoralizing loss to the Oilers on Sunday night, it sparked a lot of conversation around the future of this Penguins hockey club. In a year where Sidney Crosby has been putting up one of the best seasons in NHL history for a 36-year-old, the Penguins as a team have completely faltered. A lot of the issues that plagued this team last season have returned in a new and more frustrating manner. Before we dive into some of the structural things that have hurt them all season long, it's important to note that this was a slow-moving car crash that some people saw coming. Entering the season as the oldest team in the NHL and acquiring one of the best offensive defensemen in the game at 32 years old was a bold move. The depth scoring was a joke last year and it didn't effectively get addressed and now it's all starting to come ahead once again. What's been the Penguins' downfall this season is their offense and mental lapses in crucial moments of the game. Despite having a 36-year-old Sidney Crosby carry this team on his back, the Penguins as a whole have trouble scoring goals, especially on the power play, which is enough for Penguins fans to want to turn into the Joker. Special teams can either make or break a team, and the power play for the Penguins this season has been a reflection of their mediocrity. First off, the Penguins struggle immensely on the entry into the zone. Jack Hahn, who's a former NHL development and scouting coach, highlights the three-back system that the Penguins use for their power play entry. Typically, you'll see a lot of teams use the drop back on their power play for the zone entry, but it requires speed to back up the defenders on the penalty kill. Teams do have success using the Penguins system, but because the Penguins players don't generate enough speed, players are forced to dump it in. Rarely do their skilled players enter the zone on the power play with possession. Instead, they are forced to retrieve a dump in and win a battle before setting up in the zone. If they can somehow set up, the Penguins have struggled to convert shot volume into actual goals. A lot of perimeter action mixed with no real net front presence has left Pittsburgh with an anemic power play that's good for 29th in the league. Instead of giving them momentum, the power play usually does the opposite. When even strength, the Penguins have a lot of the same problems that Calgary was having last season. They generate a ton of shots, but don't finish. They rank 6th in shots on goal in the league, yet they're 30th in shooting percentage. A telling stat is that the Penguins have used 29 skaters for at least 5 games this season, and only 17 of them have scored more goals than their goalie Tristan Jari. That is just not good enough. Then you have crucial mistakes and poor reads that have killed them all year long. In Edmonton, the first two goals against are prime examples of this, and it just puts them behind the eight ball right away. Oftentimes, when a defender pinches and they get burned, they eat all the blame. And while that is the case sometimes, it's almost always a combination of players not being in the right spot that triggers such a decision being made. On this play here, the Penguins dump it in to initiate their forecheck, but a quick chip to beat the F1 should automatically force the Penguins' other checkers to react accordingly. Carlson here pinches to keep the play alive, and he should. His offensive instincts are what separates him, and if he's successful in pushing this puck up the boards, it keeps the attack alive for the Penguins. The only issue is that the F3 doesn't swing back low for support, and a strong defensive play by Edmonton catches the Penguins cheating. The result is a goal against and another frustrating start. Now you're down and you're chasing the game, so naturally you want and need to be more aggressive as a team. So it forces you to make similar mistakes instead of playing the right way and allowing the process to reap good results. On goal number two, this is an easier read that the Penguins defender should make. With three forwards caught down low in the zone, a pinch here is extremely risky. 
There's no F3 in sight to cover the D if he mistimes his pinch and it ends up in another goal against. When you look at a team like Florida or the Jets, their D can be super aggressive because majority of the time, their F3s are in the right spot to recover. It also helps when your D core as a whole is a bit more mobile. When you're the oldest team in the league, foot speed and timing can become an issue. An aging Latang and Carlson, along with the rest of the core having trouble defending the rush in general, it's led to a lot of similar breakdowns. Now typically, strong back pressure and support from the forwards can remedy this, but again, age and foot speed have become an issue. Looking at the NHL edge tracking data, majority of the Penguins forward group falls under the slow poke sector in speed. Most of the time, when the Penguins make a bad read, they just don't have the speed to remedy it and recover. Coaching has been a hot topic around the Penguins, and with them being an older team, why not just play more passive? Well, they have, and at times during this season, it's worked wonders. When we looked at what the Penguins were doing right a few months ago, the Penguins had to be far more passive on their forecheck so that they could get numbers back and avoid getting caught up ice. This worked well with their aging players on the defensive side of the puck, but it isn't great for attacking the game and facilitating offense. The Penguins' struggles this year scoring have been well documented, and so when you need offense, you naturally have to be more aggressive leading us right back to square one with this team taking more chances. Structurally, these tiny breakdowns have killed them in crucial games this year, despite having decent defensive numbers. Whether it's scoring on their own empty net or coughing up the puck in the dying minute to not get a point in regulation, these brutal mistakes have cost them valuable points. Mistakes happen and things go wrong over the course of an 82 game season, but mentally, this team has struggled to weather these emotional swings. Anytime a team with such skill and expectations is broken, there's a lot of finger pointing the blame. The system in theory should work for the Penguins, but whether it's personnel or just the message going stale after all these years, it has become a mess of a season for the Penguins yet again. There are a lot of rumors swirling around the deadline for the future of this team, and it's getting to the players mentally. With the year that Crosby is having, it feels like a colossal waste of a season with the clock ticking on his career. Despite his absurd production for his age, the rest of the Pittsburgh Penguins are broken. And what's next for the future of this franchise should be very interesting.